Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Today, we will explore what Florida's pioneers ate at the turn of the century. Where did fruit, vegetables, and canned goods come from? How did rural Floridians preserve their food? And what was in an 1890s kitchen? Throughout the video, you'll be asked to pause the screen to complete several activities. To begin, let's peek inside the Carlton House. Here we are in the Carlton House, built in 1885. This family had 10 kids and two parents all living here in different combinations over the years. Today, we are going to look at the differences between a late 1800s kitchen like this with a modern kitchen of today. One of the major differences between over 120 years ago and today is that a pioneer kitchen would not have any electricity, no electric stoves, microwaves, refrigerators, freezers, or blenders. When you think of a kitchen, there are several elements necessary, such as a method to heat food, and this kitchen has a beautiful cast iron stove. This stove could have been ordered from a catalog and shipped via train to South Florida. Here we have our cast iron stove. On the bottom of the stove, we have a place for putting wood as the main fuel in this cast iron stove for heating it up. Over on the right part of the stove where it says Baker's Best, that is your oven where you could heat up some food and do some baking. In the very middle of our stove, we have burners where you can put your pots and pans and kettles for heating up your food and doing some cooking. In the middle, we have a smokestack to release all the smoke out of the house. This white portion on the top here, this is actually a warmer. You could open it up, put in a tray of biscuits, sweet potatoes, or anything you wanted to keep warm, um, but not cook any longer. And you could put that up top there. Um, over here, we have a bucket of lard, a uh, great ingredient for cooking during the time period. And we have a toaster. You can put a slice of bread right here in this toaster and heat it up over a fire and um, have some really yummy toast after that. Cooking on a cast iron stove like this is different than a modern stove. Cooking took preparation. Heating up the stove would take a long time. And there are no knobs or adjustments for the temperature. You would add or remove fuel like coal or wood to reach the proper heat. And knowing this would take practice, often from early childhood. Compared to cooking over an open fire hearth, a century earlier, this stove was a huge advancement. Looking around the room, what are we going to do for storage? There are two different types of storage needed, food storage and equipment storage. Over here, this cabinet was used for storing kitchenware. Let's take a peek inside. On the top, we have ball jars that could be used for canning and preserving fruits, vegetables, making them into jelly and pickles. Over here, we have mixing bowls, all stored upside down so little critters couldn't land inside of them. Going one shelf down, we actually have um, an iron that you could put on top of the stove, a cast iron pot there, pan in the back. We have some enamelware um, that you could use for shelling peas or all sorts of things. And we have some baking trays. And one step down, we actually, this is a crock that you could use for um, preserving food once again, and then a very large pot here on the bottom. This family decided to use their walls for storage also. Back there on the wall, you can see a wooden scoop, a colander, two graters, a masher, like for mashing potatoes, a scale so you could weigh out your products, and a little rub board, scrub board for doing laundry, something like your delicates. On the table, this would be a great place to prepare all of your food items. We have a coffee grinder and a little teacup there. On the other side of the room, we have a cabinet used for food storage. Keep in mind that there were no refrigerators 
in this kitchen, and Floridians of the late 1800s had different methods to keep their food fresh. One of which is this, a pie safe. It has screens to keep flies off of the food and to allow for fresh air circulation. Let's take a peek inside this cabinet. On our top shelf, we have preserved foods. We have green beans and okra and guava. We have some cornmeal on the other side and some more beans down below. This would be a great place to keep any of your biscuits that you have made or pies or any kind of baked goods as well. A nice cool place like a well or a dark corner of the house can also keep food fresh. A major advantage in a modern kitchen is the sink. In the late 1800s, you would only have the water you can bring in in pails and buckets. Using water in the kitchen and doing the dishes was much more difficult without running cold water, heated water, and without a place to get rid of it. Can you think of any other differences between your kitchen and this one from 1885? For your first activity, you will be comparing kitchen tasks today with those of the late 1800s. Download and open the How To 1890s Kitchen document and get started. The kitchen garden was an essential part of any homestead. The size of the garden depended on the size of the family. For reference, a half acre garden would feed a family of six. Typically, the garden was fenced in to keep out pests and rows were made of straight lines for ease of use. The act of gardening was considered a reliable and dependable form of exercise for Victorian Americans in search of improved health. It was touted as a cure for depression. Children were encouraged to garden in an effort to provide them with worthwhile outdoor exploits, which would also cultivate a love for a variety of foods and nature itself. The garden remained primarily the responsibility of the mother. Tools necessary for the kitchen garden were a spade, rake, hoe, knife, planting stick, or mechanical cedar, hand weeding hooks, plow, and a pronged cultivator. Over here, this is a planting stick. A farmer would use this end, dig a hole into the earth, plant their seed. This is a corn kernel and cover it up with the other end and then go ahead and dig another hole and plant and plant. Over here, we have some garden tools that could be used on a larger farm. We have a cultivator and plow heads and some cedars, all of which could be hooked up to a horse or a mule. In Florida, planting occurred in October after the threat of hurricanes had passed. The first items planted were celery, cabbage, carrots, beets, turnips, and radishes. Take a moment to plan your planting. A carrot is a root vegetable that produces one root per plant. If a family of 10 eats 30 carrots a piece and each carrot seed can be planted three inches apart within the row, how long of a row do you need for carrots? about 75 feet. Now, open the Plan Your Kitchen Garden document and get to work. Count your vegetables as you plant them so you know how many you will have for the year. Welcome back. 
Much of the food that rural Floridians of the 1800s and early 1900s ate had been preserved. They did not have freezers to keep their food from spoiling, and their ice boxes were not always an option for all of their food. This meant that they had to preserve fruits and vegetables and smoke meat. Many rural Floridians had a smokehouse where they would hang pieces of meat in order to expose them to a low fire and a lot of smoke, which would cure them. This meat could last them through the winter and much of the summer. Sometimes they would encase the meat in salt, which took the moisture out of it so it did not rot. Behind our smokehouse, we have a salt vat, which is a large cast iron pot used for processing salt water into salt. A fire would be started under the vat, heating it to a high temperature. Then a homesteader would fill it up with Florida's salt water and boil the water for hours until all the water has evaporated and you are just left with fresh salt. Here is our outdoor kitchen. Often, Florida's pioneers had a detached kitchen. This helps keep unwanted heat out of the house. And in case of a fire, not having a kitchen attached to the wood structure could save the main house. Canning was another common approach to preserve food, used on fruit, vegetables, and even meat. Canning involves cooking the food, placing it inside a sealable container, like a can or a jar, and then boiling the container itself to sterilize. Fruit would frequently be made into jams or jellies and it was being preserved. Vegetables were frequently pickled. And meat was frequently canned with gravy and seasoning herbs. Canned foods might even last for years before it's spoiled. Head to your kitchen. How is the food in your home preserved? Today, we have a lot of food preservation technologies that Floridians of the late 1800s and early 1900s didn't, but we still use many of the same techniques they did. Make a list. Can you find meats that are cured, meaning they were salted, smoked, or dried to preserve them? Can you find anything canned? What about pickled or jellied? How many of the foods in your home are preserved using these traditional methods? Welcome back. Let's talk about unlikely sources of food. Florida's pioneers learned how to eat some of the most unlikely and seemingly unappetizing plants, like the Florida pickly pear, a spiny cactus that wards off potential pickers with some of the most convincing weaponry. Both the plant and its reddish fruit were carefully stripped of needles, boiled and turned into an edible, but not always palatable, mash. However, the fruit of the cactus does make a tasty jelly. Another example is the kunti, like the ones behind me over here. It served as one of the most important cracker foods, producing a rich starch. It was used by early settlers as a substitute for the wheat flour they had grown accustomed to in their northern homelands. Now I'm inside the Terry store, a general store built around 1900 in Florida. The store sold everything from medicine to fabric, housewares, garden tools, and even food items, including coffee. Sometimes coffee was made partially or entirely from roasting corn kernels. Roasted corn was a cheap substitute for coffee beans because it was a very popular crop during the time. It can be used as cornmeal and cornbread, 
ground into grits for breakfast, or stored inside a corn crib to dry, then to feed to farm animals. After the Civil War, ordering from a seed catalog became the preferred way to obtain seeds. And the seed companies like Burpees, Rices, and Fairies began to offer their catalogs for free and awarded the best prizes for the largest vegetables grown with their seeds. For your final activity, pause the video to play Food Pictionary. Draw, on paper or in your imagination, each food item as you read the description of its color, texture, taste, smell, and size. Then compare your drawings to the actual food items. Be sure not to peek at the answers. Okay, get started. Thank you so much for visiting. Please come back and see us again.